Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Schwartz, uh, Vice Director of the Raozongyi Academy of Sinology and Assistant Professor in the Department of Chinese Language and Literature, Hong Kong Baptist University. I am pleased today to moderate lecture number two in the series, New Perspectives on the Old World, initiated and hosted by the Raozongyi Academy of Sinology in Hong Kong and the Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences in Moscow as part of a long-term collaboration <laughs> with the added participation this academic year from Beijing Normal University, uh, Hong Kong Baptist University, United International College in Zhuhai, Guangdong. Each month we shall hold one lecture. A, lecture. a schedule of the lecture series is available on the Academy's website and online media platforms such as WeChat, Facebook, et cetera. Our distinguished speaker today is Dr. Dinara Dubrovskaya, Dr. Dubrovskaya is assistant professor and chair of the Department of Oriental History, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences. Her research interests include the history of China, international relations in Central Asia, Christianity in the East, Jesuit mission in China. She is executive secretary of the journal of the Institute of Oriental Studies, RAS. The title of the lecture today is All Roads Lead from Rome, Tendencies and Metaphors of Christian Proselytization in China, circa 600 through 1800. Um, before we start the lecture, may I just remind the audience that the event time is scheduled from 4 to 5.30 Hong Kong time, uh, PM, and this includes time for question and answer. It is being held via, via Zoom and broadcast live on YouTube. May I invite participants on Zoom to use the chat for discussion and questions. Questions for the speaker will be moderated as per their order in the chat. Uh, thank you very much. I've been told by the speaker that the expected duration of the lecture is approximately 50 minutes, and so then we'll have question and answer uh, thereafter. Now may I invite Dr. Dobroskaya to begin. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you, everyone, and welcome. I hope everything will be all right, and I'll manage uh, the technical support of my presentation. If you bear with me for a moment, I'll start it. I'll share my screen. Things that I say every time to my students and now to this esteemed audience. So I hope you see the title slide of it, Adam. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thank okay. you. So that's your home. Uh, 我很高兴欢迎你们从莫斯科,从俄罗斯科学院东方研究所,如果你们允许,我会说英文. Uh, this talk examines uh, the period from uh, uh, the 7th to 18th century, when one could follow the complex sequence interaction and interplay of several Christian denominations whose representatives ended up in the territory of the Chinese empire. <clears throat> we will trace different approaches of different Christian denominations entering China, starting from the pseudo historians, luminous religion, Jingjiao, proceeding to Franciscan monks, assessing Jesuit brothers approaches and analyzing their discrepancies with both the Franciscans and the Dominicans. I will try to demonstrate that almost 14 centuries of Christian preaching in China were not just a continuous succession of missionaries arriving to the Middle Kingdom, and I will try to trace some regularities, contingencies, as well as tragic misfortunes. Uh, history knows several attempts of unifying the ununifiable. And of course, those processes were conducted on two distinctive levels, the level of the power and the level of the people. Uh, the level of the power was moved by state and military ambitions, by the needs to protect and or gain the territory. Uh, sometimes the authorities, be it ancient Han, Han Emperor Udi or the medieval popes and kings, wanted something besides military campaigns, or they tried to launch some deep reconnaissance expeditions in order to prepare or get ready for such military campaigns. 
and as a result uh, initiated the embassies to the far lands or at least issued special envoys with small support groups like very well known to every child in the world Tang Buddhist monk monk Xuanzang and his brave companions among whom alas there were no Sunyukun the sand monk and Jubadie so pioneers of proto globalization started their activities even before the silk road in the times of Achaemenid empire and its royal road system then came alexander the great and nearly two millenniums uh, later happened the age of discovery of course uh, the goals of those prominent unifiers and pathfinders were different but the out uh, the outcome somehow seems rather similar East and West learned more about each other. Cultural and political influences flew back and forth. The world unwillingly had to acknowledge the existence of other major powers. Speaking about the carriers of Christianity to the distant Katai, we can also say that all of them are wanted to unify the world under Christian aegis. Uh, though their approaches and tactics differed. But uh, while trying to choose between accommodation and assimilation of Christianity in China, the preachers mostly unintentionally reinvented the approaches of Buddhist proselytization, which took place long before Christianity. Uh, the nature of religious differs. Uh, some don't bother to enlighten the others. Some thrive to cross the borders and broaden the perimeter. Some serve uh, the encapsulated group of people or an ethnos, like in ancient Mesopotamia, while some at the very beginning are ecumenical in nature. Uh, before Christianity, such a world religion was Buddhism. And uh, of course, the West, was always uh, has always been expansionist by its nature, lacking territories, abundant of ideas. But Christianity, <clears throat> the product of the Roman East, proved to be an ideal symbiotic companion for the expansionistic West. So the West gradually altered Christianity from an ascetic Buddhist-like form of beggar monks mendicant orders to the more individualistic and profit-oriented Protestant ethic. In this humble attempt uh, at synthesis, the mammoth body of Christian endeavor in China, I will try and speak about four main periods, main waves of Christian advance to China. That is the coming of Nestorians in seventh and then 13th century, then, of course, the well-known reconnaissance embassies of the Franciscans of the 13th century. Then the effort of pioneering avant-garde of counter-reformation Catholic orders, the Order of Jesus in uh, late 16th century. And lastly, and very briefly, I'll touch upon the competing orders of Dominicans and Franciscans in the later period of missions. I will try and probe sometime rather historical evidence and tentatively suggests some hypothesis on the mode of enculturation that was used by imported religious beliefs in their attempt to peacefully conquer China. So a uh, latest academic consensus says uh, that people who reached Tang Dynasty capital Chang'an in, 17, in seventh century were called Nestero, uh, Nestorians wrongfully. Why is it so and is it important at all? When we speak about a name or self name, the endonym of the denomination, it is always a convention to some extent. When we speak of the luminous religion Jingjiao in China, it is only for the sake of general religious history that we pursue this quest for the true name, like we are in some kind of Ursula Le Guin book. 
uh, but distancing the church uh, of the East from Patriarch Nestorius and from one of the first, if not the first, schisms of the Christian church is most of all important for the very church of the East itself. While Tang China, uh, which the followers of said church reached in a relay race mode, emerging from Persian limits, that distant land of presumably rather welcoming and religiously mostly tolerant people and government was a hope to obtain a safe haven to observe their beliefs in peace and calm without being stigmatized as heretics and schismatics. Are then the Nestorians, for the sake of simplicity and brevity, we will call them this, like the first scholars of Christianity in China, Paul Pelio and Henri Cordier, understood that uh, their fresh approach, their relatively outstanding position in Chinese religious field could help them position themselves closer to the authorities. It is difficult to say now what happened first, the grassroots spread of common foreigners professing Eastern Christianity or the coming of the famous Bishop Aloben, according to the renowned Nestorian monument, uh, the stella from Chang'an greeted by the Tang authorities with much respect and open arms. Let us consider the prototype for this inscription uh, to better understand uh, the way Christian teaching tried to make itself clearer to the local literati elite. It was Paul Pelliot who was the first to propose that Adam or Ding Ning, the priest and author of the Nestorian Stella's inscription was inspired while composing his text by the Buddhist inscription from the Dongshan temple, also called Totosu, which, mean, which means Tuta, one undergone the shakeup made in uh, 494 by one Wang Jin. Uh, Pelio even translated the Xi'an inscription using the Dongshan precedent. Why? To understand this, we need to recall that Wang Jin recounted in his inscription uh, the story of coming of Buddhism to China through intricate canvas of literary parallelism, the parallelism of Buddhism and native Chinese schools of thought that is Confucianism, of course, and Taoism. So what does one need to successfully introduce an imported religion to China? Obviously to merge and mingle it with local uh, longstanding basic beliefs and practices. That was the case with Buddhism and logically, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and logically when Adam wrote uh, his text for the Sian Stella, that was the case with Eastern Christianity. To speak with people about transcendental matters, you need to speak their own language, be it the language, language of the people and literati or the language of philosophical thought, ethics, and culture. Nevertheless, Christianity, even in its luminous religion form, failed to follow into Buddhist footsteps and did not produce any semblance of Chan Christianity. And uh, let's now talk about uh, Franciscan effort in Yuan, China, especially talk, uh, taking into consideration the interaction between Franciscan envoys from and to the Pope and paradoxically the Nestorian Christians at the court of Yuan emperors at Han Balik, present Beijing. The historical backdrop of this interaction is rather well known. In 13th century, Europe was terrified of the Mongols and knew neither what to think of them nor what to expect from them. So King Louis the Saint and a number of popes devised a plan to send some envoys to the rulers of the steppe in order to kill two birds with one stone though those stones proved to be multiple. Uh, 
the main mission of the Franciscan endeavor was that of a reconnaissance one, to contact Han Monke, to find out his intentions concerning the West after all the atrocities which befell Russia and after the Battle of Legnitsa, maybe even to forge an unlikely alliance with the Mongols against the Muslim threat in the Middle East presented to the kingdoms of the Franks, uh, the Crusader states in the Holy Land, defending the Holy Sepulchre. But of course, but of course there had always been the second goal, or rather an ambitious one, to convert the Han and his close circle into Christianity. Which one was positioned as a primary is hard to say, but the Franciscans, the brothers minorites, were then and are now mainly a mendicant order of the preachers. Their founder, Francis of Assisi, was the first to embark on a mission of preaching the gospel to everything under the sun, be it birds or wolves or stones, or even Sultan Malik al-Kamil in Egyptian Damietta in 1219. So this expansionist charge of the first minorites made them the perfect actors for the task at hand. They were ready to become the new apostles traveling to the far lands and bringing the good news of the gospel. But there was one basic mistake in this approach originating from the preaching of St. Francis of Assisi himself. When Francis understood that everything in creation should hear from him about Christ, not only people, but also birds, wolves, and stones, he didn't consider the question of language. Of course, he spoke vernacular Latin, presuming that everything under the sun understands it by default. I'm not even sure whether St. Francis considered the multiple languages of world peoples at all. We remember that during the Feast of Pentecost, the apostles gained the ability to speak every language in order to be able to preach the gospel in all earthly limits. So it seems that St. Francis took the notion of being understood for granted, but somehow forgot that it implied actual foreign language skills. And though St. Francis was a well-educated person, knowledge of Arabic was not among his skill set. Neither was the knowledge of Mongol or Chinese when we speak about the near legendary exploits of the great Western emissaries belonging to the Francisco, Franciscan order from uh, Guillaume de Rubruc to Giovanni de Montecorvino and Giovanni Marignoli. Nevertheless, uh, the first Franciscan envoys had some success, especially in Mongol emperor milieu. Let's note, by the way, that this situation also repeated itself more than once. Christian preachers could approach the throne and even convert the relatives of the emperor, but never, not once, the emperor himself. So Giovanni de Montecorvino, who worked under Kublai Khan in Kanbalik, founded the school for around 40 Mongol boys, the choir of which was well known. The church was built, the episcopate was established, but during the times of highly unsafe travels through the routes of what used to be the Silk Road, the contingency plan was not thoroughly thought through. The preachers and bishops simply died their natural deaths after some time. And though they practically begged the authorities in Avignon to send reinforcements, all was in vain. While young local Christians were obviously good while singing in the choir, as I presume was a tribute to a passing fed, but they were not cut to become full-fledged Catholic priests. Let's note here, while we are at it, uh, that the proximity of the Christian missionaries to the court and to the emperor, as well as their influence, was closer when we speak of the foreign rulers of the, on the dragon throne of the celestial empire, when we speak about Mongols or Manjus. Uh, during the embassy, 
of Giovanni Marignoli during the rule of the last Mongol emperor of China, Shunji Togon Temur. We come to the logical conclusion of the Franciscan effort in Yuan, China. The envoy brought to the emperor some gifts from the Pope and among them the spectacular black horse, uh, the letter, the offer of friendship and cooperation. And the emperor interpreted this grand gift as an acknowledgement of submi submission of the Pope. Thus, the problem of losing imported meanings in translation had never been an insignificant thing for the addressees of the Catholic, Catholic proselytization. If one wanted to be understood, one had to understand, and not just a spoken language, but the literary tradition, the semiotics, the signs, and the symbols like this presenting horse, presenting of the horse, the great black stud from the Pope was interpreted as a symbol of the celestial mandate of heaven, Tianming, and the symbol of submission. During this rather curious embassy, we also encounter the case of two Christian denominations coming into contact. That is the case with the famous Elenian god of the emperor called Asu or Asud, which members professed Nestorianism because the times of Mongol rule in China became the times of Nestorian revival. And the Elenian gods were eager to contact Western Christians and even composed a letter to be sent to the Pope with the delegation returning home uh, to Europe. Uh, even in those times, uh, the interconnections between different denominations of Christians at the court of the great Han, being the Chinese emperor, were far from serenity. Franciscans uh, wrote in their reports many a caustic word about Nestorian greediness and non-cooperability, while Nestorians regarded Franciscans as naive and ambitious newcomers, not fully understanding what they were doing and how it should be done. So concluding, I should say that Franciscan heroes, heroic, selfless, highly politically charged, and patriotic, if we consider the situation of the Europe's survival being at, stem, at stake, attempt at speaking with birds in Chinese, mostly failed. Comparing the Franciscan advance with the Nestorian one, it's safe to say that the first one was harder and more like an exploit of proto-age of discovery, when the often barefooted monks had to cross great distance to reach their destination, while the representatives of the Church of the East approach more safely, gradually, often by means of well-proven logistics of the Silk Road, merchants and caravan trade. Moreover, uh, the Nestorians came from closer abodes, from Syria, Persia, and the Middle East, while the Franciscans started from Cyprus, Avignon, Rome, or Constantinople. Uh, the next, and I should say the last period of Catholic proselytization in China is first and foremost associated with the advance of the order of Jesus, the Jesuits. Everything changed by the end of the 16th century in Europe when the church had to survive the consequences of another schism, Luther's reformation. Everything went into motion. Everything had to be rethought once again. Everyone had to be shown the right way of Roman Catholicism and the Jesuits founded in 1530, 43 in Sorbonne delivered. Once again, the apostolic function of the religious orders became very much in demand. Future Saint Ignatius de Loyola, the founder of the order and the prototype of Miguel de Cervantes' noble Hidalgo Don Quixote, the ideal knight revamped the ideas of apostolic missions. He sent his collaborator and colleague Francis Javier to India and the Far East on a mission to reach the moon, as it was thought of in those days. 
Uh, those were the times of the late uh, Ming Dynasty in China, and the country could not be more closed up. Ming Dynasty or Dynasty Dynasty was uh, the last proper Chinese ruling dynasty in China, and it was absolutely self-sufficient. All the moral, ethic, and philosophical teachings were well established. Confucianism had already received its update in form of neo-Confucianism in Northern Song times. China fenced itself from the outer world, forgot about heroic maritime expeditions of Zheng He, and wanted nothing from the outside world. But for the West, those were different times altogether. European Age of Discovery, when the ships of Columbus and Vasco da Gama rode the oceans under the sails with red crosses on them, started its first attempt of globalization. Even at first, it was thought of as a spread of Christianity alone. So first success in China was achieved uh, not by Francis Javier, dubbed the Apostle of the Indies and of Japan, but by two outstanding personalities of the Jesuit order, fathers Alessandro Valignano and famous father Matteo Ricci, who after many hardships and attempts of probing and finding the right way to reach the ears of local and intellectual elite, finally formed his famous know-how and led the mission to the court of uh, Ming Emperor Wanli. Should I look at the chat? Are there any questions? Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is Emperor Wanli on our slide. Richie had to think on his legs and perhaps his initial assumption was that to preach in China and by the way, it was he who identified China with Marco Polo's Katai. One has to change his clothes. Of course, he was not the first Jesuit to think of such trick. To achieve their goals, even in Europe, the Jesuits started to mask themselves as lay persons or just engage in their activities an additional army of semi-lay persons forming the idea of lay brothers no sisters, though. As for, as for the theoretical, um, theological basis of their preaching, the Jesuits, particularly Athanasius Kircher, reused the old Platonic idea of Prisca Theologia, ancient theology. This concept proposed that the God's initial message and Christian prophecy were given to some outstanding historical figures, including some personalia of the Old Testament, that is Adam, Noah, Moses, few ancient philosophers and semi-mythical figures like Orpheus, Hermes Trismegistus, Pythagoras, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. In general, this concept had no specific interest in foreign lands and non-European cultures, but then came Kircher, the last man who knew everything, famous Jesuit philosopher, scientist, and polymath, real Renaissance man, who used this concept to speak about the right of the Catholic Church for global spiritual leadership. So Kircher's view was taken by Jesuit missions and served as a basis for moral assuredness in their case. But uh, this approach presented just one side of the problem. It was good to have moral high ground, but then you had to transfer it to the alien culture. And the leaders of the mission very soon understood that they had to deal with a very intellectually proud and even superior civilization. The idea of central position of the Tianxia, both in cultural oikumene, and in strict geographical sense, meant that uh, Ricci would have to koto to all those concepts and somehow adjust his proselytization efforts to those notions. He also had to put up with a kind of historical chauvinism of the Chinese tradition, which implied that his Chinese counterparts, <clears throat> 
I'm sorry. And as such, uh, the Jesuits, of course, immediately chose Chinese Shenxi literati, Confucian scholars and representatives of the ruling elite, had difficulty in looking into new ideas when they were not a derivative of ancient tradition. So any innovation had to be presented as restoration. And uh, when we spoke about the Nestorian Stella in Xi'an, we have already encountered such an approach. Adam wrote about the luminous religion with the help of the vocabulary and methods once used by the proponents of Buddhist dissemination in China. Now, Richie had to think of something similar. So like Buddhism, which in the process of assimilation and becoming Chan Buddhism, mastered the notions, metaphors, parabolas, and stylistic ellipses of ancient Chinese teachings, Confucianism and Taoism. So Catholicism in its Jesuit interpretation was ready to find some common background provided by Prisca Theologia. And so God became the sky, Tian, further building up all the paradigm, paradigm from here. Especially fruitful and clear was reliance on the common morality. What could be closer to Christian ideals than moral dogmas of the Confucian tradition? There were practically no differences whatsoever. And that was the clue to the common ground for the preacher. The only thing that remained rather distant from the Confucian dogma was the spiritual component, which had to be added quite separately because the first Jesuits preferred to ignore Taoism and knew better than to pose as Buddhist monks. Not that they didn't try. They just understood very quickly uh, that the orange robes and shaved heads of wandering Buddhist monks, mendicants, asking for alms, commanded much less respect from their prospective audience than the costume of Chinese literati, because this Chinese intelligentsia equaled to the educated and ruling elite of the country. And the Jesuits knew all too well that to launch some complicated project, you have to start from the captains of the society. This approach only seemed to be easy. To enter the close circle of philosophers, poets, officials, and highbrow intellectuals, one had not only to speak and write impeccable Chinese, but also have something to propose. And here, Matteo Ricci proved to be the right man in the right place. He himself was also quite a polymath with exclusive, practically eidetic memory, with great charm, easily workaholism, and absent close-mindedness. Unlike Francis of Assisi, who presumed that birds, rocks, and sultans alike would understand his preaching in Latin, Ricci acted as a linguist and scientist. He not only mastered the language of the country of destination, but also composed the dictionary and literally translated everything into Chinese. The map of the world, the treatise on friendship, because Amicizia and Guanxi was the most important thing in China then, and it stays one of the most important things till now. And um, another case uh, which I will touch upon only in passing is the case of the famous Jesuit lay brother of the 18th century Giuseppe Castiglione or Lang Xining in Chinese, who was commissioned to walk at Manju court uh, of three consecutive emperors of the Qing dynasty in Beijing and did so for 60 years as the so-called rules of Matteo Ricci prescribed till his death as a full-fledged subject of the emperor. After Ricci led his mission to Beijing and had never seen the emperor, his companions proved useful for the authorities, be it the calendar and astronomical research, art, building and tending a variety of mechanisms, even producing modern arms. For the Manjus, 
uh, this strange symbiotic situation went through the channels of intellectual tribute of the foreign employees. Christians serve, serving at court were not to preach Christianity. So they didn't. Thus, young Giuseppe Castiglione was summoned to the court by local Jesuits to provide Emperor Kangxi with the master of European perspective drawing. Then happened the expected, the expected. Lang Shenin was asked to do things the same way as before, but slightly differently. To delicately insert some European methods in the body of local tradition. So what was Castiglione, Castiglione's method and all the Sino-European art in China? the Occidentalist art, as we call it, if not a development of basic Jesuit method of Theologia Accommodativa, only for the arts. Castiglione and his collaborators delivered those masterful and sophisticated combination of very light chiaroscuro and common ever-present lighting of Chinese traditional painting. Western direct perspective for the larger compositions and um, um, and uh, favorite Chinese orthogonal perspective for depiction for depiction of smaller pavilions. He painted the emperor, especially Tian Lung, among the lines of say Francois Clouet, rather ethereal and stately, but nevertheless with full portrait likeness. Uh, such fusion, of course, demanded precision, mastery, deep penetration into the local tradition, full understanding of the patron's wishes. But first of all, it demanded a sort of theoretical program. And I'm practically sure that Castiglione, Castiglione was one of those who just applied Rich's know-how to his field of activities. Uh, we know all too well that the accommodative means uh, of the Jesuits, which started from changing of clothes and brilliant Chinese language treatises on friendship, led to the approval of traditional Chinese rites. And this approval when the Chinese image of Christ stood on the altar of the ancestors side by side with Confucian paraphernalia was condemned first by Dominicans and Franciscans and then by the Pope, leading to the infamous Chinese rights controversy. The method of Matteo Ricci, one of the first, uh, let's say, globalizational methods based on the search of the common grounds cultural and moral similarities mm -hmm. led to one of the greatest scandals and tragedies in the history of Christian missions. When the order of Jesuits was persecuted both by Vatican and by the Manchu emperor, Yung Zhen, who not having time to distinguish between revolutionary Jesuits, conforming Franciscans and Dominicans, and just the independent representatives of the congregation of the propagation of faith just forbade all the preaching and conversion, conversion into Christianity, naming it in his edict among evil sects. So trying to make some conclusions, I would like to reiterate the, the pseudo Nestorians were covered here, not only for reasons of chronology, but also because of the need to consider the first and rather successful approach to accommodating the principles and values of Christianity in a radically different confessional environment. Perhaps it was what Voltaire and the philosophers of the Age of Enlightenment called the atheism of the Chinese, the predominance of morals and ethics in the spiritual teachings of China its ceremonial rather than religious ritual practices, and the millennia old mode of reworking absorption and incorporation into the Chinese ontological substrate of any and all alien systems of thoughts. 
that served as a precondition for not only the survival of the first Christians, but also for their involvement in the governments of the Tang and Yuan empires. Uh, the highly intellectual civilization of the Middle Empire never rejected outright and equally highly intellectual and well-developed ideas if those did not pose a direct threat in contrast to the clear and present danger of the nomadic periphery. In this admission and acceptance, several points uh, seemed to be key, but above all, command of high literary written Chinese and the conceptual apparatus of Confucian treatises, which have long become a special language of communication for the Chinese literati, scholars who made up a million strong army of managers, the state apparatus of the empire. Uh, if the representatives of the luminous religion not merely spoke their language, but were further able to translate their main confessional provisions into it, even using the Buddhist precedent, they were almost automatically seen as, peaceful, as people useful to the state. At the time of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, Christians had a fairly high position at the court of the Mongol Chinese emperors and had to somehow relate to the Franciscan ambassadors at the court. This interaction was by no means always smooth, but after the Yuan, neither the Nestorians nor the Franciscans of the old Yuan dynasty's mission survived in China. The native Chinese dynasties, such as Tang and Ming, seemed to tolerate Christianity without even ever showing a pronounced interest in the teachings of the preachers. In turn, representatives of Christianity in China who highly, uh, highly valued uh, their principles could not understand that for the imperial court, their status dangerously bordered on the status of various local sects and secret societies uh, so widespread in the country. The central government, sometimes fond of Buddhism, like the Tang Empress Wu Zetian, nonetheless did not consistently favor even Chan Buddhism. Uh, even the Qing Emperor Kangxi, who at first was quite supportive of Christians, especially the king's mathematicians, in his 1692 degree compared, also compared Christians to false sects, and in the more openly prohibitive degree, uh, of 1721 already to fanatical sects of Buddhism and Taoism. All this despite the fact that Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism constitute the famous triad of Chinese beliefs, Sanjiao. In uh, 17th and 18th centuries, everyone seemed to go to war with each other. By that time, the Jesuits had already reached the Peking court, survived the change of dynasties. The last proper Chinese Ming uh, dynasty was swept away by the new Manzhu Qingwan and flourished at the court as Mathematian du Roi, advisors on calendar, astronomy, and later as artists, architects, hydraulic engineers, and even gunsmiths. Uh, the privileged position endured even as Christianity was persecuted throughout the rest of the empire and caused a deep dissatisfaction of other Catholic orders, the Dominicans, Franciscans, and Augustinians. Especially the Dominican order, uh, which extrapolated its enmity with the Jesuits back in Europe all the way to China, could not quite see how those means were justified by the ends of Christian preaching. Correspondingly, correspondingly uh, the famous Chinese rights controversy arose, which ultimately had an effect so destructive that it led to the dissolution of the Jesuit order. And finally, the Jesuit means met their temporarily final end, the only safety island for the official Christian presence in Qing China remained at court, where during the era of the three great reigns, 
of the Kangxi, Yongzhen, and Qianlong emperors, intellectual tributaries survived. Jesuit masters, for example, led by the Italian bar Baroque, Baroque artist Giuseppe Castiglione. The work and life of Lang Shenin artistically reflected uh, the accommodative theory advanced by Matteo Ricci, making it possible to appropriate, accommodate, and combine European and Chinese ideologies. And fortunately, this was exactly what his royal customers demanded. So the almost 14 centuries of Christian preaching in China were not therefore a continuous succession of missionaries arriving to labor in the Middle Kingdom. Most of the Christian missions were not in concert with each other, either ideologically, organizationally, or historically, neither by preaching methods nor even by time of arrival. The situation changed dramatically at the end of the 16th century, when a roundabout sea route to the Far East was opened, and through the efforts of representatives of the Jesuit order, Matteo Ricci reached Beijing, thus paving the way for the successive waves of monks of other orders. The flexibility, readiness to make concessions, and adaptability of Jesuits could not help but engender a truly fatal conflict with the strict and principled approach uh, to preaching professed, um, professed above all by the Dominicans. And so paradoxically, the mission of the Jesuits, even though it was anyway forced to fight, to conquer and defend its breathing space, did not suffer quite as much from the rejection of the local Chinese population or from the persecution of the authorities as from their direct superiors in Rome and their fellow preachers. Uh, this presentation began, uh, started with uh, the photo of Pope Francis kissing a Chinese child in St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, offered uh, as a symbolic and hopeful depiction of further developments. Indeed, Pope Francis bears the name of the founder of the Franciscan order who preached to the birds. He is also a Jesuit, and the grace of his pastoral kiss is directed at a Chinese child whose parents are clearly happy. Uh, they are happily included under the aegis of the Holy See. As history shows, the great pontiffs with rare exceptions during the rights controversy, tried as originally intended in their position in ancient Rome to build bridges between peoples and cultures. And uh, one hopes that uh, over those bridges, which once allowed apostolic missions to make their way from Rome to countries of the East, Catholics from these countries of the East will somehow soon find their way back to Rome. And uh, I thank you for your attention and I hope I wasn't too boring and uh, my presentation wasn't too long. Thank you again. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Dubrovskaya for a very stimulating talk. Um, I think it was very well received. Uh, I. I we have, um, I think, one question in the chat that I see. I'm not sure if you want to answer it or not. It's really up to you. Um, I have a, a question that I would just like to ask to start is in terms of metaphors. Um, oh, here comes one more, which is good. So we'll, we'll take it in order. Um, but just in terms of metaphors, could you in, in some ways just uh, perhaps like just refine it into give us one or two of the best examples that you have just to make it a little bit clearer. I, I picked up one from your talk on the horse, but if you were just <laughs> thinking in terms of metaphors, what, what would kind of be kind of the best examples that you, mm. that you have? Oh, uh, well, yes. I, um, I thought of this uh, title, metaphorical title, and I thought of uh, some, examples of proto-globalization and proto-unification and all this. 
And uh, well, the horse is a well a well known example, uh, which was um, researched not by me, but uh, by another researcher. And uh, this is one of the examples of misunderstanding, of course. Uh, but uh, I don't readily have um, some analogy to this horse example of this <laughs> present mispl misplaced present but you know there is uh, another thing uh, for example a very curious one um, perhaps uh, I spoke about Jesuits and the advance to the um, Beijing court but what was uh, the the entrance uh, the foot put uh, in the door it was the clock you know the mechanical wonder mm -hmm. and uh, um, it was the times when uh, the Chinese forgot about the great um, inventions in technology and uh, the West was uh, a little bit more prosperous in technology and in telescopes and everything so all the Jesuits had this clocks and other wonders and uh, Emperor Wan Li uh, just loved the clock and this was uh, um, this was uh, the instant when the Jesuits had to enter the palace to help uh, wind the clock <laughs> so uh, well, while uh, the great black horse was an unfortunate present just a mechanical clock was a fortunate <laughs> present and uh, this uh, you know point of entrance this trojan horse for, mm -hmm. for the christians uh, at the court of china but they achieved nothing at the court they just served uh, the intellectual tributaries and uh, the supporting uh, employees to um, to wind the clock. <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure that I answered your question, it's, but it's uh, fine. Uh, yeah, fine. I tried. Thank, Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Dinar, do you want to have a look in the in the chat? Because I see um, there's a question from uh, Yang Bing Nian is one. Uh, I'm not sure if you want to answer that or not. And then there's one more recently uh, from 4.51 uh, p.m. from Wilson. Can you see? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. You know, uh, the um, inscription on the Nestorian Stella is, is a huge one. <laughs> it is really a very long text, a, a huge uh, inscription. And of course, uh, it is combined of different notions and uh, different ideas, and even Zora, Zora three stick ones uh, too. Uh, well, uh, what wh what could I say about this claim? You know, uh, really, uh, meanings are lost in translations, and. Um, uh, I forgot the word. And um, researchers after researchers are just, you know, um, trying to wrap their heads around these translations. And when we speak about uh, religious notions, ideological notions, it is very difficult to say what is Christian, what is Buddhist, what is Zoroastrian. So you can uh, interpret it in this way and you can interpret it in that way. And by the way, this was uh, the reason for um, Xuan Zan's travel to India, when uh, the initial meaning of Buddhist uh, treatises was lost in China, and he had to uh, renew them and to travel and to obtain the true scriptures. So interpreting the Nestorian stella is, uh, is still a challenge, yes, and I, I'm not... Um, opposing uh, the notions of some Zoroaster, uh, Zoroastrian influence there, but poor Nestorians, poor, poor representatives of uh, luminous religion in China, you know, they were stigmatized as uh, um, not true, not correct Christians. And now we try to add some Zoroastrian uh, ideas to them. So, um, so it's open to interpretation, I think. Mm. Uh, and there was another, thank you, Wilson. Uh, uh, there was another question, I think, in the beginning. I saw one, I saw one at... Um... 
Yeah, so about the yeah, religious before, before, peace right. and re revival yeah. Yeah. Uh, that would be great in future. Of course, it's everyone's dream. And, uh, you know, when we speak about Christianity and about uh, such um, great figures of the past, for me, it is a kind of... Um, uh, kind of a miracle, maybe, to understand that Buddha and Christ were better people than we are. <laughs> it, it is it is naive. I understand it is strange to um, speak about this in our um, academic milieu, but uh, we are speaking about um, uh, religious beliefs and. Uh, um, notions and values and uh if the question is would that be great yes it would be great after two millenniums and two and a half millenniums uh, after the people had already thought of this uh goodness unification and uh, um, great values for everyone so i hope everything will be good if uh, ice caps won't if ice caps don't melt on us all. <laughs> so, well, I think you're, can... you're closer to the ice caps, I think, than we are. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are melting. We have snow here. <laughs> okay, well, um, thanks very much again for a very stimulating talk. Uh, as I mentioned before, this was lecture number two of a really kind of exciting new series that uh, JAS, uh, the uh, the uh, Raozhong Academy of Sinology, uh, the Raozhong Guoshuian at uh, Hong Kong Baptist University, and the um, Institute of Oriental Studies, Russian Academy of Sciences, is working collabor collaboratively to present uh, this academic year uh, in the hopes of um, simply forging a, a stronger bond between the two institutions, but also by extension to kind of open this up to a, a wider uh, audience, and that's why we've decided to uh, broadcast this both on Zoom and through uh, YouTube Live. Um, I would just like to also uh, say in advance of our next talk is December the 17th. Um, right now, the exact time hasn't been fixed, uh, but uh, please be on the lookout for that. For all those people who like gold, uh, we have uh, Dr. Julian Cooper, a lecturer from the uh, uh, BNU, so Beijing Normal University, Hong Kong Baptist University, United International College, and he'll be speaking on flesh of the gods over 4,000 years of gold mining in the eastern desert of Egyptian and Sudan. Um, so I would like to end here and thanks everybody for joining. Uh, take care and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Adam. Thanks okay. everyone. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.